affectionately named Crashgate. The events that follow in the story cover the Singapore Grand Prix from the 2008 season, and they're centered around Fernando Alonso, two-time world champion, Renault Formula One team, and Nelson Piquet Jr., who hails from Formula One royalty, the son of Nelson Piquet Sr., three times over the world champion of the Formula One series. On the Renault Formula One side, we'll be talking, of course, about the managing director at the time, Flavio Briatore, and executive director of engineering, Pat Simmons. There are two sides to the story, just like with every tale. What it looks like, and what's beneath the surface. In order to tell this story properly, we have to do it in three different parts. Act 1, the fall from grace. Act 2, the crash. Act 3, damage control. Act 1, the fall from grace. Despite having the blood of one of the greatest Formula One champions we've ever seen running through his veins, Nelson Piquet Jr. was just a rookie. And on that day, the 15th round of the Formula One season in 2008, the first night race that we've ever had in Formula One history, Nelson Piquet Jr. just made another rookie mistake, going into the wall at turn 17 on lap 14 of the 2008 Grand Prix in Singapore. On a more aggressive strategy, two-time world champion Fernando Alonso was already into the pits by the time Piquet had made his wreck and a lengthy safety car emerged. Alonso took advantage of the fact that other teams were in the pits and had clean air in front of him. He took the lead because of this, held on to the lead, and took Renault's first win of that season in his first in about a year. And this race didn't put him in the hunt for the Formula One championship. It barely put the team in the hunt for one of the best constructors on the grid. So over a decade later, why are we still talking about this race? We start with understanding the players to this story. So let's start with a familiar face, Fernando Alonso. Alonso, having been in Formula One since 2001, had been driving for Renault Formula One team for five years, since 2002. Highly regarded as one of the best drivers in history to squeeze every point in the maximum out of the car. With Fernando Alonso behind the wheel of the car, the Renault Formula One team saw massive success. This was particularly true in the 2005 and 2006 season where he became double world champion. Fernando Alonso went to McLaren for the 2007 season where he was partnered next to Lewis Hamilton who had one of the greatest rookie seasons we've ever seen in Formula 1 history. Missing out on the championship by a single point, by most standards, would be pretty successful. Gutting, but successful. But when you do it next to a rookie, when technically you lose on countback to a rookie, on paper, this was not Fernando Alonso's most impressive result. The Renault R27 did not produce the same results as its recent predecessors. Aerodynamics was the key focus for the R27 and the major differences between that and the successful R26. Fresh off championship winning form, the R27 failed to even win a single Grand Prix. In fact, the R27 only took one podium at the Japanese Grand Prix in 2007 by the rookie Kovalainen. Having failed to win a single Grand Prix, Renault needed to change something. The plan was pretty simple. Get Alonso back and pair him next to the 2007 reserve driver at the time, Nelson Piquet Jr. That season wasn't really the return to glory the Renault team had actually hoped for. Entering the 15th race of that season, the Singapore Grand Prix, the duo of Renault were comfortably behind on points and pace. Following the conclusion of the Italian Grand Prix, Renault was deadlocked with Toyota at 41 points in the Constructors' Championship. The BMW Sauber team was a distant way off at 117 points with neither PK nor Alonso being within the top five of the Drivers' Championship at the time. But if Alonso was able to string together strong performances, starting with the Singapore Grand Prix, he could end up splitting the Sauber duo of Robert Kubica and Nick Hadfield for fifth place. With the background, the implications, and the importance of this Grand Prix set, we go into the next act. Act 2. The Crash. We begin this act on September 26, 2008, where we see Fernando Alonso actually running well all weekend long, and even ending the final two practice sessions in first place. The following day in the qualifying session, Fernando Alonso continues his strong run, and it looks like he could actually land on the third row of the grid for the start of the race. But unfortunately, Alonso failed to progress further than Q2 in the qualifying session due to a mechanical failure in his R28. Accordingly, Alonso was relegated to the back of the grid in 15th place next to his teammate Nelson Piquet in 16th. And while an aggressive strategy at Singapore makes sense if you're fighting for a podium, not necessarily from 15th place. But here's where the controversy really begins, because Alonso went with a strategy that was, at best, unconventional, and at worst, it was suspicious. Alonso opted for a two-stop strategy starting in 15th place, fueling up on a first stint of only 12 laps. If he was lucky, he had enough fuel to maybe make it to about 14 laps. 
At the time, and after the race, it was expressed that the team didn't really feel that the circuit was actually capable of making enough overtakes to go on a one-stop strategy. The technical engineers also concluded that the brakes weren't strong enough to be able to take a one-stop strategy. Just two laps later, after Alonso's early pit stop, PK Jr. went into the wall at turn 17. It's worth noting that at this point on the circuit, turn 17 is a very difficult place to remove and recover a car. Both Rosberg and Kibitza had planned to pit pretty early, but not that early. Both of them were forced to go in despite a safety car coming out to remove PK Jr.'s car. This meant that they were both going to serve 10 second drive through penalties. And this was the only rule that allowed cars to go into pit lane under a safety car. Other than running out of fuel, you have to wait until the pit lane is open. This rule was in place to counteract the fact that if there was a safety car, whoever could get to the pit to refuel first, well, they would actually come out better than any other driver. And you had to line up behind the safety car until pit lane opened. Once pit lane opened at the Singapore Grand Prix, basically every single car who needed to pit, pit to refuel. Alonso took advantage of this and in a big way. The perfect timing of the pit stop allowed him to run in clean air and make up many positions in those crucial laps. The only other cars that were actually able to pit before the safety car was deployed were the two Red Bulls and one Honda. Meanwhile, in pit lane, Ferrari and Felipe Massa encountered a pit stop nightmare where he left with the fuel hose still attached. He was forced to drive to the end of pit lane before his team were actually able to make it to him and remove the fuel hose, but it was too late. His race was essentially over. Meanwhile, Nico Rosberg was forced to serve his drive through penalty along with Robert Kubica. And after the penalties and a couple other mechanical failures, Fernando Alonso inherited the lead. Alonso took the checker flag for the first time in over a year and gave Renault their first win that season. The podium was completed by Nico Rosberg in second place and Lewis Hamilton taking six points in third place. At the time, the grid mostly just moved on. We kept racing and the Formula One season came to a close relatively quietly. It wasn't until the 2009 season that we saw things spring back up from that fateful day at the Singapore Grand Prix in 2008. And it was all kicked off by Nelson Piquet Jr. being dropped by the Renault Formula One team. Act 3. Damage Control. Lewis Hamilton ended up winning the Drivers' Championship by a single point, denying Felipe Massa his world title. And due to the fact that, indirectly at least, Felipe Massa felt that that wreck at the Singapore Grand Prix cost him the driver's title, he raised some questions about the incident. But at the time, Max Mosley, who was the FIA president, dismissed them. They didn't really have any evidence and it was simply speculation. Thus, the 2009 season commenced, but not very well for Nelson P.K. Jr., who never even scored a point. Being on a single-year contract doesn't speak volumes about a team's belief in your ability to perform, but getting a single point would have helped. Meanwhile, Alonso, not necessarily turning heads with his results, but Alonso, he did have 13 points by the 10th race of the season, which is where the Renault team actually dropped Nelson P.K. and decided to bring on Roman Grosjean, of all people. Here's where things get really interesting, so we're going to do this in a timeline fashion. Confirmed through the testimony, we can look at all this pretty specifically, and we know that PK was fired on July 26, 2009, less than a week after being fired from his Renault drive. Nelson PK goes to the FIA to report the incidents from the 2008 Singapore Grand Prix. He claimed that Simmons and Briatore directly were asking him to crash on the 14th lap in order to give Alonso the edge. The events that played out at the Singapore Grand Prix in 2008 were exactly as they engineered and planned. And planned it was, down to the very turn that they wrecked, knowing that the safety car would have to be deployed and it would be pretty lengthy. Alonso would use this time in order to separate himself and take maximum points, which played out perfect. And just about a month after he made the initial claims, Brazilian TV came out with a story that said that PK Jr. was ordered to crash at the Singapore Grand Prix. This forced the FIA into action of some sort, saying they were investigating quote-unquote alleged incidents at a Grand Prix previous in the F1 calendar. They didn't actually say what Grand Prix this was, but it was pretty clear, at least to those questioning Renault's return to their winning form in Formula One. And after a swift investigation following the announcement from Brazil TV, on September 4th, 2009, the FAA had concluded and officially accused Renault of conspiring with Nelson Piquet to fix the Singapore Grand Prix from the 2008 Formula One season. The governing body wanted to hold an official hearing into the matter and decided to host a meeting at the FAA World Motorsport Council. This was to occur just days shy of the one-year anniversary from Crashgate, before they could even arrive at the council hearing in Paris on the 21st. 
PK gave his second public statement about the incident, while simultaneously, it turns out that his first statement somehow was leaked to the press. The residing FIA president at the time, Max Mosley, was forced to respond. In doing so, he was able to confirm that, quote, I haven't seen anything which I believe to be a forgery. In the sworn statements, it's clear that PK is implicating both Briatore and Pat Simmons of Renault. It's worth pointing out, though, he doesn't directly implicate Fernando Alonso for knowing about the strategy, merely benefiting from it. Although his implication about the fact that he probably should have questioned the overly aggressive strategy was duly noted. Also included that following day after the leak is exposed, Max Mosley is forced to admit the fact that he had offered Pat Simmons immunity for testifying and giving information about the incident. And the drama persisted as inside that same week, Renault counters with their own criminal charge, saying that they would be pursuing criminal action against PK and PK Sr., quote, concerning the making of false allegations and a related attempt to blackmail the team into allowing Mr. PK Jr. to drive for the remainder of the 2009 season. Immediately following the press release, details surfaced about the fact that Pat Simmons had just blown the case wide open. It was reported that he had spoken to FIA investigators and told them the fact that Nelson PK was the one who initiated the idea of crashing in the turn 17. So, in a way, it was 100% off the table by the middle of September that Renault was just not involved. That was out of the question. They were involved in some way, we knew for sure. And on the 15th of September, we see the Times newspaper actually publish records of the radio transmissions they had gotten a copy of. Not even a single day had gone by after the Times published that report issued this statement. The ING Renault F1 team will not dispute the recent allegations made by the FIA concerning the 2008 Singapore Grand Prix. It also wishes to state that its managing director, Flavio Briatore, and its executive director of engineering, Pat Simmons, have left the team. Mind you, just five days earlier, on September 11th, they announced that they would be pursuing criminal charges against the PKs. And at this point, it's pretty clear that Simmons, at least, is admitting something happened and that he was involved in some way. Briatore, on the other hand, is persistent that he had no hand in the matter and that he only resigned to protect the team. Despite the fact that Renault had actually come out and said they would not dispute the charges, that September 21st, 2009 meeting at the World Motorsports Council in Paris went ahead as scheduled. It essentially amounted to a sentencing hearing. The council decided that the most appropriate course of action to punish the team would be to disqualify Renault Formula One suspended two years. As long as they stayed out of trouble and did not repeat any of these egregious offenses, then they would be fine after two years. It essentially was probation. Simmons, on the other hand, was banned for a total of five years, and it's likely that he avoided indefinite banning from the sport due to his cooperation. Flavio Briatore's maintaining of his own innocence, despite the overwhelming evidence that was cutting against his claims, is ultimately what got him indefinitely banned from FIA-sanctioned activity. As for Fernando Alonso, he was absolved and cleared of any sort of involvement in the matter. At the time, the FIA were still recovering from a couple other major controversies, and it's thought that Briatore is made an example of. He announced that he would be challenging the FIA decision just a month after the FIA had passed down the ruling to essentially de facto ban him for life. Briatore, in early January, actually ended up winning that claim, and he was awarded 15000 in compensation. Less than a week later, the FIA announced that they would be mounting an appeal of their own. And to avoid an ongoing legal battle, the FIA announced in early April that they had made a settlement with both Simmons and Briatore, and that this issue was put to bed and over, and no more legal action would be pursued by either side. Additionally, the FIA compromised and said that both Briatore and Simmons would have to wait until 2013 before they could work in Formula One. One of the more confusing outcomes of the Crashgate incident was the decision to let Alonso keep his points from that race, despite the fact that it was engineered. Now, many will fairly argue that it was early on in the race. Despite being engineered, Alonso technically didn't inherit first place after that crash. Coupled with the many other incidents Fernando Alonso may not be at the center of, but he is just off camera, just off screen, and to some people where there's smoke, there's fire. This episode of F1 Wars was one of my favorite because it does a bunch of things all in one. One of the things that I wish we knew more about any controversy period was what happened after. How did things actually develop? You know, you see the one big thing and that's it. But with Crashgate, everything was playing out basically live. The other thing that I love about this story is it makes a driver human. So often we see these, you know, our favorite Formula One drivers and we see them as almost like godlike. 
they're absolutely blessed athletes with unbelievable instinct, but they're still people. And you know, for the first time we see a driver fail and what they're willing to do to undo that error, that mistake, to secure their seat in their future. What lengths are they willing to go to? And behind every major controversy is a desperate human and sometimes the driver's involved. One thing I'd like to know in the comment section below, was Alonso involved? Did he know? How could a double world champion not question that kind of strategy to go out on, you know, on 12 laps to expect that low of a fuel load when you're starting 15th on the grid? That doesn't make any sense, right? Whether you think Alonso knew or, or didn't know, it's, I'll leave that to the comment section, but the fact remains is that it happened and it's probably going to happen and always going to happen because all these things are driven by people. We all have flaws, but hopefully the F1 Wars episode and all these, this whole series sheds lights on all these incidents so that we can better understand and hopefully adapt in the future. But who are we kidding? So thanks for checking this out, guys. I really appreciate your time. I'm going to see you very, very soon for the next episode and just for the next piece of Formula One content. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. If you are a friend of the channel, thank you, and I'll see you soon.